Well, let's see it. Uh, let me show you quickly all the um, all of the uh, controls you need to control IRA. Okay. There they are. Yeah, what's great about IRA <laughs> is it introduces a whole new level of uh -huh. usability. It's point and shoot. So you can see here. So it's almost like a camera, but easier. It's exactly. A, it's, it's, it's one virtual setting. Virtual it's really how long do you want it to process. Uh -huh. That's the only setting that drives IRA. Mm -hmm. And so now I can tell it to render the same scene that you saw an hour of pre-processing um, hadn't even finished half of the pre-processing. Okay, so right now, the GP, as I see GPUs on the lower right, the GPUs aren't nothing. doing anything yet. Right. And why is that? The CPU is still working on pre-processing. It's translating the data into the form GPU needs and moving it over to the GPU. And then in just a second, there, there go. we go. The GPUs are now Our fully computer. loaded, uh, wow. processing the scene. And now, Mike, Michael, one of the things that, that is a real benefit of iRay, um, you, if you could talk about, point to the subtle, subtle visual effects right. that we're seeing, that as a result of a physically real mm -hmm. photon simulator, what are the benefits that you get? Well, first of all, um, you're seeing all the light in the room come in through double double set of windows, then being reflected off of a semi-glossy floor, going through this uh, semi-reflective uh, table. There's an interior lights in the scene being combined with the out exterior lighting. And so the things that... And for the people that are in the audience that are in, in the area of computer graphics, the, the, just the, the initial heroic part is almost all the light from the scene are not direct. They're That's all indirect right. it's lighting. It's all indirect exactly. lighting. And so um, what you're seeing is that any point in the scene, for example, here can be illuminated by anything else in the scene. And so I'm simulating light coming in, hitting this, bouncing off of here, reflecting off of any number of surfaces, and finally making its way to this indirect area. So what you'll see, even after less than a minute, is that you have all these subtle shadows, you have very, very clear demarcation of, of the su subtleties in the corners, you have the semi-reflective table. I uh, see the lamp reflected on the tabletop. You see the lamp now, reflected th on the What's table. amazing is that, that apparently that piece of glass is obviously captured as a geometry and has its own BRDF, Correct. because light is going into the glass uh -huh. and is bouncing around inside the glass and uh -huh. is escaping through the side, and that's one of the reasons and why it lights up on the edge. That's right, and yeah. so you see the little, that little, little there. bright light there. So these little yeah. subtle things are things that, you, that really make it appear to be a photograph mm -hmm. to you. If they're not there, you notice that they're not there. Mm -hmm. But these are, these are effects that are very difficult to achieve in the current CPU ray tracers because they require you to set up each, I would have to set up a lot of parameters for this table to make sure that it actually was able to calculate that point. Now, now Ken, what's amazing here is this. I mean, this, this entire scene is BRDF driven. Correct. And, and it's got this new renderer in it. Um, you've incorporated it into 3ds Max. Now, what do I have to do as a user to launch this render? This is it? That's it exports everything to the render? It exports everything to iRay? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think what we should be clear that there's a Quadro in this box and a Tesla. So we're really talking about just two machines here doing something. Now, if you, if you had the CPU do the same task, we'd still be looking at a dark screen. We'd mm -hmm. still, even with, you know, anytime you have to try to physically calculate things precisely as they should be, you know, you don't, you don't have the power right now with the CPUs. Even if I had 100 CPUs, mm -hmm, it would still mm -hmm. be. Now, of course, just now when we first launched the, the render, within a second or two, uh, I saw the scene. Mm -hmm. right? And, and um, although it's going to take, we could still continue to improve the quality of that scene mm -hmm. over the course of, of several minutes, within about a few seconds, I now yeah. know whether I've lit it properly, yeah. I like the design, I have the feeling for the scene now. Um, whether I like the angle, so on and so forth. Right? Yeah, this that's is a fantastic mm -hmm. feedback because immediately, almost immediately, mm -hmm. I can make my creative decisions and decide to, you know, to go in a different direction, change the lighting, change the time of day, whatever it is, but I get immediate feedback, and that's what drives the creative process. Now, you're, you're, you're now done creating this amazing beauty, the mm -hmm. building, and you want to go show it to a client. Yes. Right? And you want to go take this out to a client, and you say, um, but you can't pack this... HP, right. this wonderful HP workstation with, with, uh, with two CPUs. Is it four CPUs or two? It must be it's four. It's two, two quad core. Right? Two two, quad it's a dual yeah. quad core. Dual quad core. I see. There were 16 threads. It must be hyper threads. Right. Yes. I see. Okay. So there were dual quad core and two GPUs. You can't lug this thing around. I can't. I know that. Right. But and yes. so, but you, you take this out to your client, and your client says, you know what? Um, I want to see it from a different angle. Right. Is, there, is there a way for us to do that? Yes. So let's move from what's shipping uh, next week to subscription customers is some research that we've been doing with uh, the Mental Images and NVIDIA team. 
So here we're going to take you to the cloud. And this is the first really showing of uh, 3ds Max having published the data to the cloud. Now, mm -hmm. what can you do with it? Now, Ken, let me see if I, if I understand here. Now, now uh, you're at the client. You're on this laptop. Yes. And, and um, uh, you open up a browser. Mm -hmm. And you have, you've now published uh, your data out to the cloud. Correct. And this could be, in this particular case, where are we hosting this? This is hosted at Pier 1 Hosting mm -hmm. in uh, Toronto, about uh, 2,500 miles away. 2,500 miles away. So your, your workstation is now 2,500 miles away. You've, you've uh -huh. published yeah. from native 3DS Max up into the cloud, and you've taken this laptop out to the client, and the client says, you know what, that's, that's really close, but, but um, right. not quite right. They look at this, they say, well, that's a nice final image, but that's, uh, I'd rather look around the room. Well, because we're running in the cloud 32 Fermi processors all simultaneously working on this same image, I can just simply walk around the room in real wow. time. And uh, <laughs> what you're seeing is, I think, the first great. full interactive photorealistic <laughs> rendering. Now, what's, what's happening here, Michael? So, so uh, it's not this laptop that's doing this. No, so, the laptop so is let's just see. a web browser. I, so send, I send to the cloud just in my position. My right? position. Yeah. And, and then you rent, OK, go ahead. And the, the cloud, all 32 Fermi processors are working simultaneously on this image. Um, they're all running exactly the same IRA software that's run in inside Max. And we can guarantee that the image that you will get from this is exactly pixel for pixel accurate to what you would get in 3ds Max, just a lot faster. And you can see that when I, le when I lift up my, um, my mouse, then it just simply converges onto the final frame. Instead of taking maybe 30 minutes to converge on the local machine, it converges in 10 seconds. So well, essentially let's, let's what I have is full, full image, uh, full photorealistic image rendering in near real time. Mm -hmm. Now show me some of the art in this room. So oh. I'm, I'm one of the clients and... and um, well, we could, for example, go to a, uh, an alcove here, get a little view of the room, notice that there's nothing there's nothing there. I could add some objects for you. OK. Uh, let's say we want to add a, a difficult object, a vase, which is uh, glass, and it's going to cause all sorts of interesting things, and uh, a reflective object. And um, again, I'm just telling the server to turn on these objects. Now you can see. Uh, you're, you're, being, you're being heroic mm -hmm. just because you want to do a demonstration. I mean, the, the, these two objects are particularly difficult yeah, to render for computer graphics. Especially this one, this yeah. nasty glass thing, because not only is it difficult to render this, let's take a closer look at the vase, but um, it is casting light into the environment wow. through caustics, and so light is coming in through the glass, hitting this, and then being refracted back down to cause that green tinge on the, on the uh, counter. And again, this is something that really requires a physical simulation of light to get it well, right. Well, that could have been a texture map that's pretty big, right? It could be, except I can change the time of day and prove to you that we really are doing this interactively. Wow. wow. <laughs> that's it. something else. I think this is really the first time customers will have real-time uh -huh. interactive photoreal tools for collaboration and decision making. It just hasn't existed before. And so, so uh, from now on, well, you guys, 3ds Max is used by the vast majority of the world's architecture yes. firms. Correct. And so now, now all of these, all of these uh, architecture firms and interior design firms that want to go out to clients and show them their, their, their wonderful work of art, they could do it on a laptop, exactly. they could do it in their office, they could do it anywhere on the web. Yeah, they, uh, many customers have told me that they're usually changing the proposal on their, uh, in the taxi on the way to the uh, customer. So this uh -huh. gives them the unlimited flexibility of just showing up with a browser and then taking their customer through it and, and responding to the customer's mm -hmm, interests. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. Guys, this is really a great breakthrough. Yeah, we think so. Congratulations, Ken. Thanks. Thank you. Congratulations, Thank Michael. You. Good job.